Um, good afternoon, nearly good evening to everybody. Um, my name's Gornia Humphreys. I'm delighted to welcome you here to Diff Circle, this uh, panel event on short film festival strategy. Um, it's a subject so close to my heart. Um, I'm the festival director of the Dublin International Film Festival, but I'm also you know, somebody who's very aware of how difficult it is uh, to try and navigate the festival world and, and answer questions about this all the time. And so it felt like a really good opportunity at, as the end of the summer comes by to, to, to sit down with uh, a, a really interesting combination of skills and perspectives on this subject and hopefully to answer some of the questions uh, that may be on your mind or coming into uh, you know, your, your kind of like timeline for the next couple of months or indeed uh, the years to come around planning how to get your film out um, from uh, you know, the final production uh, phase and out into uh, uh, a festival, into, into screens and, and on its kind of like uh, journey. Um, I did also want to just mention, I suppose, from our perspective as the festival, that there's a huge number of films um, and, and I'm very aware of that. So, you know, what we're hoping to do is to get as many questions, perspectives um, and through this particular panel and to give you as much information as we possibly can. Just a little bit of housekeeping to start. Um, the event is going to be an hour long. Um, it is being recorded and um, we will have time for questions. We've actually structured it so we'll have questions. So if you have any, please, please put them in via the Q&A tab and we will get to them probably in about half an hour, about halfway through the session today. And we will try and get to as many as possible. Um, I would like to say a big thank you to Screen Ireland, uh, to Mags, to Callie, uh, to Brian um, and to everyone um, in Screen Ireland and the marketing team for helping us to put this event together. Um, and I'd also like to thank my colleagues, um, Karen, uh, Sam, Maeve, Megan, um, for helping to put, again, an event like this together. It's really important for us to try and put an event that speaks to the people whose work we show. Um, and also just to say to sign up to Diff Circle. Um, I think there's all the details are there. And also if you could fill out a poll that we have, um, uh, it's in the holding, uh, the holding part, I think, of the, of the um, webinar today. So we have a great team um, and I'm really delighted that we actually have this team together because to my mind, there's all these different pieces to this conversation. So um, without further ado, what I'd love to do is uh, introduce um, Shema Khan uh, is an account manager with a wealth of experience from London Flair PR who specialise in the film entertainment industry um, and Shema has worked there for over half a decade. She's been pivotal in the Oscar and BAFTA winning campaigns uh, for the past um, eight years, and they have achieved 32 Oscar nominations and six Oscar wins in that time. She's also a specialist in festival campaigns for heavy hitters such as Cannes and Tribeca, and she's an intricate part of the publicity team for Holly Shorts and Raindance. So a fantastic person to have to talk about uh, approaches um, from a publicity uh, perspective and, and about designing your strategy. Um, I would like to introduce our two amazing filmmakers and thank you so much guys for joining us. Um, TJ um, is an acclaimed Irish filmmaker who first gained recognition at the Young Director Awards in Cannes in 2013. He's directed international commercials for clients such as Under Armour, Isaacs, Peloton, Volkswagen, UEFA, BMW and the European Union. He's received awards at prestigious festivals including the Discovery Award at Diff um, and the Bingham Ray Award at Galway. And his films have been showcased in Tribeca, or brought, showcased in Tribeca, Clermont Ferrand, and the BFI London Film Festival. His short film Wave was featured in both The New Yorker and Disney. It won an IFTA in 2018, and Silence earned a nomination in 2021. Um, his most recent film, Room Taken, won the Best Irish Short Film at Diff, and Best Short Film at the Cleveland International Film Festival, making the film eligible for Oscar consideration for the 2025 Oscars. Uh, Nell Hensey is a passionate filmmaker with a keen interest in female-centric narratives, coming-of-age themes and stories that explore outsider identities. Hensey has written and directed work supported by Screen Ireland, Virgin Media Television, RT, the Arts Council and many more. Uh, her short film, Good Ships, uh, premiered uh, at DIFF uh, last year and was the first uh, in Irish cinema to depict a majority Asian cast. Um, her last film, Falling for the Life of Alex Whelan, was a half-hour um, show, uh, drama, sorry, broadcast on RTE. 
uh, uh, last November, I think it was now, uh, and she's a co-founder, creative director of Pure Development Pictures and curates a range of TV and film projects across the company slate. Now to Sharon Badal. Deep breath there, Sharon. I'm just going to go with industry legend. We could go with Titan, um, the woman who, you know, told the Lumiere brothers, you know, to come out the factory door and, you know, you know smile. Uh, she is as you can tell, a very longtime friend of mine, which is I'm teasing why I'm teasing her. She's a full time faculty member at the New York University Tisch School of the Arts for 20 years. She's a former vice president of programming for the Tribeca Film Festival, which is where many people who are watching and listening today will know her from. She comes to Diff nearly every year and has a wide circle of friends, both here and in the UK, where she teaches and around the world. Um, it's fair, I think, to say that the you know, Tribeca short film uh, reputation is created and 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 uh, designed by this amazing woman. She has also produced numerous live events uh, and worked in distribution and marketing for three major studios. And I'm going to finish um, by saying that she's the author of Swimming Upstream, a life-saving guide to short film distribution. So I think you can see we have a good panel. Um, and I think that they're positioned in ways that I hope we'll be able to answer, as I said, most of the questions that might uh, come up over this hour long session today. So I'm gonna kick it off actually, and maybe maybe I could ask you, Sharon, you know, what is a festival strategy? And and when does it start? Thanks, Grania, and thank you everybody for having me here. Um, I think it starts way at the beginning. It starts when you are, even in the script stage, when you're, when you're writing your script, you have to think about who your audience is, who is going to be interested in this besides you and your family. And then I think as you get into production, you need a line item in your budget for festival expenses. Feel, be optimistic that you will get into festivals and go, but how are you gonna pay for that journey? And then I'd say right when you're in post, you really have to start developing a strategy or what I like to call a wish list of festivals that are both you know, big reach and ones that you think you have a good chance at and and then proceed accordingly because your festival calendar begins when your film is ready. It doesn't begin in September and end in June or begin in January and end in December. It's when your film is ready. So I think that's the first thing is, you know, to do it as early as possible to start thinking about what you want from that film because if you make a 39 minute 59 second film perhaps you aren't actually making it for the festival circuit and there's another agenda but if you are then you have to begin to develop that strategy very early on and could i ask you actually shema because one of the things i'm conscious about is research you know is about people being very aware of what kind of film they have and what kind of festivals that that they should be aiming for can you talk a little bit about about your perspective on on that you know information and what you know a filmmaker when they're coming to you do you know what I mean what they should already have if you like you know mapped out and and kind of what point point you would join that journey I think when it comes to when you come to finding a publicist for your film for a festival or for award season or whatever it is that you're you know sort of focusing around um the best thing would be when you approach a publicist to have already be submitted into a festival because when we start doing our our work it it kind of is catered around what you're promoting and if there's nothing attached to the film that you're promoting then it makes our job a little bit harder so and also if you're kind of sending us a film to get our feelers on what we think about it and you know whether it's where where should it go or you know who can we put you in touch with to, to promote it even more um make sure that your film is finished completely and I think only then submit your film even to festivals once your film is completely finished because they'll judge it on based on what you submit and can I ask TJ and, and Nell I'm coming to you if you can tell me maybe about your own experience of that you know one of the things that I'm always saying to people is that you need to know what kind of film you have. You and you need to be very clear about that. 
because there's many festivals that just are completely irrelevant and a waste of money. And then there's other festivals who are very definitely interested. Can I come to you first, TJ, and just talk about, you know, maybe, you know, talking about Wave, about where you wanted to go, how early you kind of knew where the kind of key wish list was and, and what kind of research you did in advance? Um, yeah, I, I, I think we started off, like Sharon was saying, um, once we had a timeline of when the film was going to be finished, we sent a few early cuts that weren't finished to festivals and they didn't get in. So once it was finally locked and we kind of had a, a little bit more of the post-production done, we submitted it and actually got into Tribeca. And I guess that was, uh, you know, the best festival that we could get into when we had finished, you know. So I think it's very much determined on when your project's finished. You kind of look at what is the landscape, what are the festivals that are ahead of you. And then you think about the genre, I suppose. Like if it was a genre film, you might submit to genre festival festivals like Fantasia, etc. But uh truthfully it really is it's a bit of a numbers game. You've got to submit to as many as possible because it's so competitive, you know. So I feel like especially maybe uh, another strategy could be seen as though we're, we're Irish filmmakers, you should you could submit to international Irish film festivals as well to maybe get into some foreign ones that are abroad. But uh, I would I would advise sending to as many as you can because uh, because it's definitely competitive to get into them. Wow, okay. Nell, how did you get on? I mean, you had a different journey, didn't you, with Good Chips? Yeah, slightly different. And even before Good Chips, like I think when filmmakers are starting out and you're working with much smaller budgets, like there is a, I know for my earlier films that would have been made for less than 15K, like, you know, the realities are, is that it's going to come out of filmmakers own pockets and not everyone can afford that. So I think with starting off in like smaller projects, like even just concentrating on the Irish scene alone and like, we, like our goal was like to premiere at either Galway or Diff and like, then work around that and then with good chips because that was a slightly increase in budget and we worked with virgin media through their discover scheme so diff was a part of like that, that like scheme. so yeah so it was uh and then similarly with like rt and storyland it was the kind of end goal for that project was to go on the player and to go on rt so it really depends i suppose where not only when you're planning the initial project through story phase, but even like how that film's going to get made and what stipulations are going to be required in the distribution of those kind of deals. So it depends really, but yeah. I mean, from my perspective, I do think if you can find out about a festival before TJ, what, do you know what I mean? Find out what they, they like, do you know what I mean? If there's a taste, if you have a chance to go to that festival and have an understanding of what those kind of festivals are like, I think that gives you uh, maybe a greater sense of whether or not they would be interested in the kind of, of films that, that the kind of film that you've made, you know? Um, but Sharon, can I ask you, when you were watching films, when they come in, do you, you know, people are using platforms a lot of the time. They're using Film Freeway or they're, 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 they're submitting through an official space. Can you talk a little bit just to give people a sense of how their films are evaluated? So, you know, you open submissions, you know, you know, when do you like to receive films, for instance? I mean, I I absolutely hear what, you know, um, Shane was saying about, about it being finished. I mean, do you watch things that aren't finished, for instance? Absolutely. I think what is the most important from, from our perspective is that it's a, at least a fine cut picture. That's really what we need to see what the story is. And uh, if you're a rough cut picture, that means that you're kind of risking your reputation on something that you don't know how it's going to be in the end. But we're all of us, you, me, everyone who programs, we're used to watching temp music and non-final sound mix. And, you know, that as long as I can see the story, I feel like I have a good grip on the film. That being said, the filmmaker has to feel that the film is in a good enough condition to be evaluated properly. Now, I nor any of the so many people that programmed for me at Tribeca all those years, we would screen blind, didn't read anything, didn't look at any of the film freeway stuff, the film lives or dies of its own accord. If you really like a film, if you, you might be curious about the director's statement on Film Freeway, but 
all of that stuff, like if a filmmaker is going to put the effort in, put the effort into the film and not the stuff on Film Freeway, which is not going to get watched by a programmer because we don't want it to influence us. And how many times would you watch something? Would you watch something twice in one season? Would you watch it a second year if it didn't get in the first year? What what was the policy for, for Trebekah? Mm. Resubmits are rare. There has to be a substantial recut for there to be a resubmit because, and that's why you really kind of only do have one shot at a festival. Um, but, you know, we, Tribeca got in 2023, which was my last year pro programming the whole gig, uh, over 8,000 shorts. And so you have a huge team that's watching and watching so many a week. And um, we were very fortunate because everyone that's, that was a screener or an associate programmer for shorts, 95% of them worked for other festivals. So we could trust their eye because we knew what their eye was for their own festival. And so every film gets rated once and then the top couple hundred would then get watched by me and Ben. And then we'd kind of duke it out and narrow that down, narrow that down, narrow that down until it got to around, you know, six, 65, I think was about the average that we program every year. But you can't watch it. That's the same as a filmmaker saying, oh, I, you know, I just, uh, I have a new version. I'm going to submit it. We don't have time. We don't, you don't have the physical time to watch a film more than once. You watch it, you rate it, you move on. That's with that kind of volume and that kind of avalanche, that's the best you could do. And did you ever give feedback? Did, did you, I, what's the structure in relation to feedback? I mean, I know that a lot of our programmers write notes yeah. and they rate the films and that's how the progression, if you like, from yeah. submission to shortlist to, to final kind of like decision. Is that the same in Tribeca? Yeah, there are notes and a numerical rating system. And if it's, you know, the, the lower end of the, of the scale, I'm not even going to read those comments. I'm only, we're only going to read the top, you know, three categories, but um, I don't, you know, it's, it's a tough go because you want to give each film a fair shot. And I think you do. I think, you know, you do watch it. Everybody pretty much watches all the way through. Now me, because I have, and this is not a fabricated number. I have more than 21,000 film reviews in the Tribeca database, right? So I know, I have the history of the whole festival in my head. I know after 12 minutes, if it's if it's a right fit for us. So I may then fast forward, see what's going on, fast forward. But I would say the majority, if not all of the people that screen watch every short all the way through. Mm-hmm. I now, TJ, I'm going to come to you in a minute just to ask you in re, in relation to how you positioned your films when you were sending them to festivals. If you described them in particular ways, do you know what I mean? What what way you wanted, you know, programmers whether they did or didn't to view your films? Do you know what I mean? And what kind of material? But maybe, um, Shamo, I could come to you and ask you about, you know, from your perspective as somebody who is, you know, taking particular clients and looking towards awards campaigns, looking towards the big A-list festivals, are there particular kinds of short films that you are particularly interested in? I mean, I wouldn't say that there are particular films that we're interested in. The ones, I mean, having worked in the awards season for so many years, we do mm. know what voters and Academy voters like to watch and like to see and they all have they all like sort of the hard-hitting films you know the ones that are very very just sort of gut-wrenching and you know they 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 have a big topic to them or, or something like that or it, it it depends on the year I mean we have sort of changed the trajectory a little bit because um I think it was in 2022 we won with an Irish goodbye which was actually a dark comedy it I mean it was still it still had that element of darkness to it but it was funny and films like that haven't ever actually won a, an Oscar in the short category before it's always been your very heart-wrenching gut punch kind of film so I mean it's kind of changed over the years really um in the beginning I would have said you know make it as 
you want to make the audience cry kind of thing. But now it's it's sort of changed. It can be a little bit lighthearted. Last year we had a film um, called Troy, which was at Sundance, and it was about gigolos living next door to a couple. Very quirky, and that went for the Oscars, you know, and it, it got quite far. But um, it, it just depends. It depends because as as there are three phases to the Oscars, and as it progresses... Um, the Academy voter pool becomes bigger and bigger and bigger, you know, to the point where you're, if you, once you get to the nominations, you are catering to the entire Academy. And that's kind of when it becomes harder for your film to be competing against the others. So I think to make, I mean, I think just make something that you're very passionate about. And, uh, okay, so this is the hard question and we're just addressing it early. Is there a length which is the most attractive length for a short film? See, for me, now I'll be honest with you, when when you get to like the award season, for example, and this is inside knowledge I'm going to give you, <laughs> the, the voters have to watch at least 30, I think it's 30% of the film, which I think equivalates to like five to 10 minutes of a film before they can switch off and say, you know, I'm no longer watching or whatever. So I think if your film can be 15 to 20 minutes long and within the first 10 minutes or the first five minutes, even I would say that you can capture the audience, that is sort of like the winner. Because if if it's in the first five minutes and, you know, you've picked up your phone or something or you've looked at, looked away at something or something has distracted you, then you know that, you know, the film for me, for especially, I would I would be like, well, if I pick my phone up in the first five minutes, it's not interesting. Then It's not interesting enough. And if I'm doing that, then imagine what an Academy vote is going to do. We're not going to waste filmmakers' time, like going through an entire Oscar campaign and fully well knowing that, you know, within five minutes, a person's gotten bored or something. Mm. So I think it's important to make it, we have had films in the past that have been over that time, but I think 20 minutes is sort of like a cap point for a short film. Okay. Okay, I'm sure we'll be coming back to that at some stage, but thank you for that. Um, TJ, when, were you conscious of who was watching your films and of, of, just, of, of if you like, addressing them in any way? Do you know what I mean? When you in were terms submitting of like them. programmers or like festival committee kind of? Well, yeah, exactly. Did you, just, did you work on your log line? Uh, Do you know no, what I mean? Your, oh, no, your synopsis. Yeah. It was interesting hearing what Sharon said there about not reading that stuff because like... <laughs> over so many different short film projects. Like I, I I definitely put in a good bit of effort into that in terms of a director's statement and all that sort of stuff. But sometimes like you just get like say five or 10 rejections and then you're like, I'm gonna change that statement. Maybe that'll help, you know? <laughs> and it might not, but like you're definitely aware of it and you're just trying to give yourself the best uh, foot forward to, at, at the end of the day though, though I don't think a great director's statement and a not great film is going to get you into a festival. So like, I think it's always going to be judged on the merit of the work, but um, I suppose it's worth at least trying to give yourself the opportunity to hopefully um, make people understand why you were interested in making it and personalize the material maybe, but honestly, I, I, I don't know if it helps that much. So I try not to um, go on too much. Sometimes it can be a bit overly pretentious if you write an essay, but at the same time, you you know, you want to kind of give a little insight as to why you're passionate about the story, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And now, how is it for you? Were you conscious of, of the people who would be watching your film and, and evaluating it and judging it? And did you kind of like shape your 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 ask, if you like, to them? I think so, yeah. And And kind of like what TJ was saying earlier, like you kind of know, like it's a great strategy to be going for like the Irish festivals abroad because inherently that's such a specific niche of what might help your short film stand out. And so for the likes of Good Chips, because it was a very Vietnamese heavy story as well, we would also target um, Vietnamese um, festivals as well. So we, that enabled us to go over to Paris and we also went over to LA with that. Um, so yeah, I think it's more though understanding what the story is and what what unique selling points I suppose your story can bring and then tailoring the festival strategy to that as opposed to trying to kind of force it into um like like we 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 usually kind of went with like okay, we're going to try like two major festivals that are quite a long shot, but we wouldn't be spending a huge amount on like we would be very specific in terms of like okay, we we think there's like a very high chance 
the festival will have an interest in this story so that's kind of how we how we would play it yeah yeah um I usually ask my my uh, students whether they're early people early morning people or late at night people and you know inevitably the people who are sitting at the front say early morning and I smile at them because they're my kind of people and then there's all the other people sitting at the back who say that they're not they're last minute merchants and then I explain to them that if you're a programmer the films coming in at the last minute are just stacked up one on top of the other. And you're watching them with this cosh of I had to get another 15 done before I can have my lunch. I have to get another 20 done before this. And I was wondering, Sharon, from your perspective, talk to me a little bit about that. Do you know what I mean? I mean, I do believe early is a better for me. I, I, I've got a better headspace. I'm watching something. I may be open to that story or seeing that story for the first time when I've seen five other versions of that story by the time it gets to November. Unfortunately, there is a part where I go, God, that one that I saw in April, that was much better than this one. Do you know what I mean? But talk to me because again, I'm really interested that people listening are aware of how you're evaluating their film and when is the best time maybe to submit and to think about, you know, the, the kind of viewing practice i suppose of of programmers and not to think it's some computer or an algorithm or how you know sitting in an office just yeah. churning out reports you know <laughs> yeah no there is that we are human believe it or not uh and i well for for us for from my experience both um you know at tribeca and then i just uh, was one of the programmers for big sky docs last fall um it doesn't matter to me. Like at Tribeca, there have been multiple years where we've selected the last film that we watched that wow. came in, the, the like number 8,149, 8, you know, got in. Uh, but I do think that the difference is that as the avalanche increases, so does the number of people watching it. If I'm, if you want, my eyes on it or you want like the head people eyes on it you're going to submit early because we're the only ones on at that point and then as as it progresses with the different deadlines more and more of the team come on and then it's less likely that you're going to get kind of the the top um the head of the programming department is going to get your your project then that's that's the difference. But for me, it it I actually because it's so regimented and we have so many weeks to do it, I never actually felt crushed at the end. I felt kind of excited. What I think is interesting about the end, about kind of what you said, is trend. By the time you're halfway through the season, you see what the trend is that year. Yeah. Is it? Is it zombies? Is it refugee films? Is it, you know, what what is the trend? And you do get a sense of that as you're going along. And that is when you start comparing, well, I'm not going to have, you know, 10 refugee films in the in the program. So of the, all the ones we've seen that rated the highest, what do we like the best? That's mm -hmm. where you start competing. The filmmakers start, com unbeknownst to them, start competing with each other on mm -hmm. subject. Mm -hmm. but no it doesn't matter it doesn't matter or I mean earlier I'm more excited because you're just starting a new season but I I think it didn't if I was watching in you know when submissions open in September or when we're trying to lock the program in February they got the same attention for me okay um Sean, can I ask you about about stars or 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 elements that that are are you know, part of what might make something jump out, do you know what I mean, uh, opposed to an, another film. Can you talk to me a little bit about that? I, I mean, as to whether or not that, you know, does work, do you know what I mean? Or whether or not it can actually just be another tricky piece where somebody says, you know, well, I have this actor or I have, you know, a particular element. Do you find that that, you know, uh, you know works for the premiere and that's all? Or is there a particular thing that you would say, you know, if somebody has a very shiny cast member, what they should do with that? Um, we have had in the past films with big stars in them. And it just depends on the time of year. I mean, for festivals, it definitely gives you an edge, I think, to have a big star. 
um, because, you know, especially if they can come to the premiere and stuff like that, for, for example, for Tribeca, um, we have in the past had, um, we had a film, Ben Stiller's wife was in the movie and, you know, Ben Stiller came to the premiere and it was just sort of just a huge attraction and lots of press was interested. Um, so it does help in that sense, but does it sort of help the, f it, it depends. It, for the Oscars, definitely. We do sometimes suggest that you, to, to be able to get sort of trades interested early on in your film, we do sometimes suggest to get an executive producer on board. And that would be sort of like a big name attached to the film. We've in the past, you know, we've worked with, um, God, my brain's gone blank, but we have worked with stars in the past and we have had them come on at a certain point to elevate the game for for the Oscars, for example. Um, it definitely, and you know, it's one of those, it works as an exclusive, you know, trades are interested, they can, it once once it's out as an exclusive, say for example, in Variety, it gets picked up everywhere. So it does mm. definitely help the press. But whether or not having a star in your film helps, because sometimes you can have a big star in your film, it depends on how much they're willing to do as well. Yeah. If they do lots of press, then, you know, great. But if they're sort of just saying, I'm a part of the movie, I'd like all the attention to go to the director, which generally happens with shorts anyway. A lot of publications want to talk to the directors, sometimes the producers, the writers. Um, and it's less about the actors. I know with features, it's the opposite way around. Um, but it, it all just depends on how much how much the star that you, or the stars that you have are willing to do. If they're willing mm -hmm. to, as they can then great but if it's just sort of a, a case of you can use my name and that's about it then it kind of limits what you can do yeah I, the reason I suppose I'm saying that is just I, I just think when you're putting your festival strategy together there's lots and lots of different things including do you, know what I mean? you have to look at every single thing that might be a potential media piece or a social media media kind of like moment and um, I'm going to ask you Shana, sorry I'm going to ask you another hard question here but can we talk about images and photos and materials and what is the essential number of images and what you would need from uh, a, a film and a film project oh, the minimum Shaima yeah for you sorry um so what we say is before you even get a publicist on board is to within your budget to, to budget a, a very good photographer for stills because that is something that we is something that is used for reviews interviews and all of these kind of promotional anything to do with press stills you you should have a, a great headshot of yourself um have a trailer ready there's a whole list of things that materials that we ask for but realistically out of those materials what we use is probably your bios, um, trailer and stills. Stills we put a lot of emphasis on because that is something that is so universally used in every publication that you see your film in. So, and if if you have sort of like low grading or, you know, dark sort of stills, it, it makes it a little bit harder to, to show because what you're trying to do with those stills is you're trying to basically show them what happens in your film through picture, through, you know, a, a still image. Um, and you kind of want to be able to have that encapsulated within within a still or a couple of, I think, I think maybe like five, six stills would be great, would be great for publications because that's the kind of the amount that they generally like to use anyway. I mean, if you have more, great, but just sort of really, really, really good photographer for that, I would say. Okay. Can, I can, add, I, can I add go, something sure. on that? Yeah. Go uh, for it. Also, you know, we call them thumbnails because when you reduce them, when you, when the audience or the reader is looking at them, the the image is the size of your thumb. So you have to reduce that image accordingly and make sure you can still determine what it is and have both horizontal and vertical images because they are used for different purposes. And your log line make sure you don't give stuff away in the log line. I've actually called filmmakers when they, you've probably had this Shima too, where I've called the filmmaker and I said, are you sure you want me to put this on the website? Because you're kind of giving away a twist here. And 
that that your log line should make people want to see it but not give away too much away kind of say a similar thing is that when you're sort of same when you're talking about your film to try and have it down to two sentences because that way you're not giving too much away you're not boring people and it's not you're not droning on and on and on about you know can you imagine if somebody's setting the scene for you backdrop this and you're in the amazon and it's you know you really don't need to know all of that you want to know what what's the film about two sentences and always be prepared with questions for other filmmakers say for example if you're at a festival and you're trying to make connections which i know can be daunting for some filmmakers um but to have questions prepared whether it be about their projects or whether it be about you know their life or something just just to go sort of prepared with that so that you you know you come across as interesting and like you're wanting to learn more about them as well yeah, that's always my thing is when you ask somebody what a film, what their film is like and is it good and they go, it's OK, it needs a bit more work, it needs more money. And you're like, come on, you're the champion for this film. You're meant to be the person stepping up. The other thing I would say just on, on, on the images is, is from catalogues and from any place where you're flicking through multiple images. I don't understand how you, people don't understand how important a brilliant image is because it's so funny when you go, oh yeah, I saw that in the catalog. You don't remember the name, then you remember the name, then you're telling other people. And it, it is literally just the easiest selling tool. And people so often, as you said, don't necessarily you know, put the money into getting a, a professional photographer, getting those images and then those images. My favorite is the Irish film of two people walking down a country road shot from behind I just please do not show me that that shot anymore because you're also looking at an audience looking at it and deciding whether they would actually like to go or not. And TJ, when you were uh, submitting, what, what kind of materials did you have? I mean, do you want to, you can talk about Room Taken or for, for Wave. How, how were um, you, yeah. yeah how so were you set up? Just one little thing about what you mentioned earlier about why it's a good strategy as well to, uh, to send in early. Uh, there's early bird prices as well. That's something worth noting for, for people. It's like cheaper to send in early as well. There's three different stages. So uh, that's, that's a good strategy as well. In terms of what we had for say room taken, um, we premiered in Cork last year. And uh, then at that stage, we were kind of putting everything together to start submitting to, submitting to all the different festivals. So we were still like finishing the film while we were starting to submit. So it was a gradual thing, which which was fine. But I suppose in an ideal scenario, you'd have everything ready. And um, I don't know, like we were talking about earlier, if if it's all uh, needed. But I, I suppose the stills are definitely needed because if you get into the festival, they're used in like uh, the, the programs and stuff. But uh, we tried to make a trailer. Um, we tried, we didn't get a website. I've done that before. I don't really know if you need one. It's good to have a, a, a Instagram page because then you can use that to kind of promote the film. And I think that's useful. Um, and then what else did we have? We made a press kit, just like a little simple thing in case, you know, um, it was ever required for, for, you know, an interview. We got an interview in IFTN and that was helpful because it kind of helped to kind of give an idea of what the film was about. And that, you know, we tried to make something snazzy looking and in design because, you know, it, it obviously is more presentable, but I don't think it needs to be like super polished and high end. You could still make something pretty basic and gets a lot of information across, you know, like in a press kit, you'd have all the different details of the film, the duration, the funders, the aspect ratio, uh, if it has technical uh, specific, uh, like technical uh, things like uh, the, the mix, the sound mix specifications. Um, and then also you might even add in like some bios and maybe like a little interview or something that just kind of gives a flavor for what the film's about. I basically copied the Irish Goodbye Lads press kit, to be honest. So, uh, <laughs> so yeah, you know, you just find whatever you can to kind of uh, to, uh, to to come across as professional and have all the relevant information to, you know, um, yeah, to try and help you get into more festivals. <laughs> yeah. Copying other people's strategy. I didn't, I yeah, yeah. Copying comp, strategy, yeah. You see yeah. a comp that yeah. looks like something that is similar to your film and then totally. chart where they went. And, yeah. And, and I think festivals as well, you know, depending on the genre, obviously. Like if you make a, a sci fi, it might not be going to like a, a comedy festival. But you know what I mean? Like if, if you feel like there's a similar world and you see other short films or filmmakers who've done well, you know, why not try and get inspired or understand like how they uh, were successful and then maybe implement it into your own strategy. 
And now, can I ask you about word of mouth? Because I, I feel like it that's an interesting part of it. Do you know what I mean? Is the audience response, how people feel. Did you, were you aware that was something that you could use? Because I mean, obviously Good Chips had a, had a particular screening in Diff, then it went out on, on, on Virgin Media Television. And then that's, that it's, it feel like it's festival run started after, after that. Do you know what I mean? But did you, because I know you had a lot of materials were you ready to go, do you know what I mean, in order to kind of galvanize the response to the film? Well, for Good Chips, just with the production schedule, we literally shot like a month or two before Diff and then we were delivering very, very soon um, before the premiere. But I suppose because we had the broadcast as well, like that generated a word of mouth that almost no other festival could have, just because you're reaching thousands of people as opposed to hundreds. And like there's benefits to that as well and but there's also like cons so like we weren't eligible to apply for a lot of film festivals and because mm. we were broadcasting because we were online for like a duration so it kind of depends but I think like it like you were saying before like going to festivals and getting an understanding of what they're looking for and the kind of people that go there and the kind of general vibes is really good and I think um, if you can do like if festivals have like programs or labs, that's another fantastic way to like get involved if you don't have, say, a film that year, because then you get a sense of like just the festival and then you can almost tailor your future work to that um, as well. So have you have either of you stayed in touch with your festivals, the festivals that you've screened at? Because I feel like that alumni piece is really important. I mean, I know that we have alumni on this call. But Sharon, it is, isn't it? When somebody says, I've got a new film, I'd like to come back. And, and you know, you do feel like that's a natural relationship. Yeah. I mean, TJ and I, we we saw each other again at Diff and the app and, and all of that. And it's, no, it's, it's very important. You have to know that every festival that selects your film kind of feels that you're part of their family and they want to know and they want to support you. And part about what we do as programmers hopefully is help you move forward in your career. So we hope that you'll come back to us with your next project and that you'll keep in touch with us if something great happens to you that isn't even festival related. You know, you get an opportunity to direct an episodic uh, or, you know, you want a grant. It's great when you contact the festivals and let them know what, what you're up to. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And Shami, can I ask you about premieres? I mean, this is going to be one of those questions about, you know, where should you premiere first? Should you, home, should you, you know, go home or international? You know, how do you balance up the kind of premiere requests, you know, from certain festivals? Do you have a, an insight into how to, you know, navigate that particular kind of like rocky kind of situation? With festivals, because it's such a it's, a it's a numbers game, like TJ was saying, it depends on where you get in. I mean, if you have sort of like LFF or Aesthetica, then obviously you would pick LFF to be like your premier festival. But it doesn't really make that big a difference where you premiere. I mean, if you get selected into a good festival on your first, you know, sort of go, that's great. And, you know, later on along the line, I know some filmmakers do do that as well, where they get selected into a certain f festival and then, you know, they'll later on in the year get selected at a bigger festival and say, you know, this is my premiere. But you can have different kind of premieres because, I mean, I think we worked on Tribeca this year and there were a couple of films that, you know, were having their New York premiere there. So it does set you aside and it can help with press as well. Um, but it's not something that we sort of, we look out for, you know, it's not something that we're sort of, you know, you have to premiere at a big festival. If you premiere at a big festival, great. But if not, you've, you've kind of started your festival journey and it's, it's a journey. Like, you know, you'll get selected into so many different festivals and along the way it could be big, small, you know, and it's all, it all, it's all great because it all adds all these beautiful laurels onto your poster. Um, and you know, it looks great. The more festivals you get selected into, the world loves your movie. That's kind of what it's saying. And from from your perspective, are you looking at certain festivals or are you approaching those filmmakers based on that? Or are you do they come to you? How, how, how does your kind of interaction, you know, start? There are certain festivals that we do look out okay. for 
as um, um, you mentioned earlier, I we do we are the publicists for Holly Shorts and Rain Dance. So we do look out for the films in those festivals as well. And both of them happen to be Oscar qualifying festivals. But there are other ones like Tribeca, which is just it's such a great festival for press. Same same goes for Cannes. And um, I think th those are kind of because it's such a it's such a busy sort of time, six months out of the year, we're doing the award season at such a busy time. We kind of like to slow it down a little bit just for that, you know, to have a little bit of a sort of like a window of a breather kind of thing. So there are certain festivals that we definitely look at. We've we've in the past worked on Cam, we've worked on Palm Springs, we've worked on Tribeca. Um, Holly Shorts is a big task because, you know, with a fe festival publicist. So you're kind of looking after the entirety of, you know, how it's running and managing it all. So that does, it, it depends. It depends on on the workload at the time. There are definitely festivals that are better for press throughout the year than others. Um, but yeah, but th those are the kind of the ones that we kind of target throughout the year. That's really helpful, Sharon. From your perspective, I mean, I'm I'm conscious that there's loads of festivals around the world. Do you know what I mean? And some are going to be great for press, uh, and and others are actually maybe going to be better for industry, or they're going to be better for for meeting people. They're more kind of like in, informal or whatever. Can you throw out some of them? And, and Nell and TJ, I'm coming to you in a second. So do you know what I mean? The, the festivals that you really enjoyed. So Sharon, do you want to kick off with some of I yours? think uh, London Film Festival to me is great. Obviously, Diff is great because anybody from the industry, I'm speaking to it from an industry perspective, what you're looking for is you're looking for opportunities to meet the filmmakers, right? I want to see maybe what you, the film that's playing at Diff where I met you is not quite the right fit, but I'm good. I met you now. I want to know what you're working on next. And I think that there's a difference between kind of industry festivals and kind of public facing festivals. Like Tribeca is a public facing festival. Mm. You know, the public buys tickets, but there are a lot of dedicated events for filmmakers. So I think that, uh, you know, a festival like London, like Palm Springs shorts. I mean, for, for shorts, it's great. You and Claremont Front for shorts. Yeah. Um, I think if you are lucky enough to get into a Toronto or to get into a con, then A, you do need a PR person and B, you kind of have to know that the shorts, if you made a short film for those festivals, that's not the sparkly for them. The features are the sparkly. So mm -hmm. you're not going to have that kind of attention. But I also think that in the States, for example, regional film festivals are great. New Orleans, San Francisco, Chicago. You, you have We have all these great regional festivals and there are the similar in, uh, in the UK, but, um, and in Ireland, of course, with Galway, uh, mm. Cork and stuff. But I think that, that, there's a difference between what what you, what are you looking for? Are you looking to yeah. meet industry? Are you looking to raise money? Are you looking to you know uh, get coverage? It's yeah, kind of yeah. And now, which were the festivals or were there ones that you thought you really really enjoyed and that you were able to maximize the your kind of you know investment in getting there or screening? Um, I think for Good Chips, a big highlight for us was the Viet one. Now that was very specific to that project because it was it's like the biggest festival in the world for Vietnamese cinema. So that was really nice. And like it, what when I know before this, we were talking about like, is it beneficial to have like certain cast involved when you're going to festivals? And like with Good Chips, because it was the two kids, like they like naturally the press were just so enamored by them. So that was like very helpful as well. Um, but that was a more kind of personal festival. But when I was doing um the filmmaker lab in TIFF, like you could just kind of sense, even though it was a very big, um, this kind of big festival that they really cared about the filmmakers and like those audiences just were there because they just love cinema. And I think that's a very kind of nice way to go about it because sometimes it can get a very kind of like businessy and stuff. So I don't know, from a creative filmmaker point of view, that was a, a wholesome, wholesome one as well. Thanks, Nell. TJ, did you have any favorites? Oh, there's been loads. Like Tribeca is was unreal. That was a real career highlight in 2017. 
we were like a the, love in for Tribeca there. Yeah, yeah. We were having the crack and uh it was just it was an amazing experience just being in New York watching your film on like a cinema screen there, you know. But like even all over, there's been so many amazing kind of experiences. And I guess it depends what you're looking for. Like there's obviously industry focused festivals. There's ones that might be local to your hometown, you know, like in in uh, in Ireland as well. You you probably want to focus on uh, going for the main festivals, Galway, Cork, Dublin and um, foil as well. That's an Oscar qualifier. So like there's certain festivals that are accredited to like, you know, uh, big institutions, whether it be IFTA in Ireland, there's a whole list of IFTA qualifiers. So they're probably worth submitting to, you know, to to be on IFTA's radar if you're if you're hopeful for trying to get nomination, which would be amazing for your career, you know. Um, and then obviously in the UK, there's BAFTA qualifiers. Internationally, there's Oscar qualifiers. So all those festivals kind of carry some weight. And uh, I suppose they're good to look at and see if you feel like you're a good fit to submit to any of them. Yeah. I mean, it's also about being a champion, isn't it? I mean, you have to do a lot of those work. You have to be the person who, you know, does the Q and A's, goes there, you know, goes to those receptions or those panels, and, and you know, offers themselves up to do workshops and and kind of anything you can because that's that's the visibility piece. Do you know what I mean? That's the point where you're able to. We've had a question in here about animation shorts and any kind of like specific advice that people would have around animation shorts. Shema or Sharon? Sharon? Yeah, I think I mean we're animation qualified at Tribeca. I did that application, so I think I kind of have a sense. Um, if you are making an, so look for those festivals that have uh, a, a animation co competition, and obviously, if you have an animated film, you should submit to Annecy. That's the mother load of all you know, uh, animation festivals. But I think that what I'm seeing a trend on, which is interesting, is longer animations and and yeah. the running time of animations and understand that that's a bit of a challenge too. So if you are making a longer animation and by longer, I mean like 20, 25 minute anima animated piece, then that is uh, a different type of challenge for a programmer mm. that doesn't have a, uh, an animated competition. Yeah. I mean, I'm going to say something controversial here, though, but I do think you should go to see as many short programs as you possibly can and, and ask questions. Do you know what I mean? About where your film is going to be shown and what, you know, what kind of, of, of program it's in. Because I do think that's, it's really important, you know, that you that ask questions. People sometimes feel like they can't, you know, that they're just going to annoy people or they'll turn them down on the basis of being annoying but actually i i think it's more that you're taking care and um, we have a couple of questions here um jamie is there an ideal length for an oscar campaign for example if you win a qualifier very close to the shortlisting time frame of december are you at a disadvantage publicity wise and festival journey wise how important is a festival journey to gain traction and buzz around a film so i think before you even if you win an Oscar qualifier within your first festival, for example, which it happens, it definitely does. We never, we never sort of rush you to do to to do an Oscar campaign there and then. Um, from once you've made the film, you have two years to submit to the Oscars. So there's 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 ways that you know do the festival run, get the laurels. You know, you you never know if you've won one qualifier with your first festival, then you're likely to win more. And it only looks good because then your film has been seen by the world. It's been received and it's, and, you know, it's been liked. Um, and it gives you it gives you a bit of an edge to have. You know, we had a film, I think it was last year or the year before now. I might brain fog a little bit. Um, but they, uh, they I think they they submitted to like 90 film festivals or something like that. And they had so many like acclamations and awards and things going on which just looked great for the film itself um so i think i think that that's definitely 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 have a festival run a year of a festival run looks great um in terms of how long the actual oscar campaign is it's six months we start from september through to march um and the reason we like to start in September is because it gives us that that sort of the first phase before the shortlist, the pre-shortlist is crucial because it gives you a good 
three, three and a half months to get as much press as you possibly can around your film. And um, it's great because you're not only getting the film's name out there, but you're also getting the filmmaker's name out there as well. And um, we have had films that have come closer to the shortlist, but we tend not to take films at that point because we have a full slate by then anyway. Um, but definitely, I mean, if you if you are sort of considering doing an Oscar campaign and you you think okay it's closer to the shortlist, definitely send us the film and we'll we'll have a look and we'll we'll definitely try and work something around it. Considering that you know that our team and everybody connects with it. Um, but it does put you at a little bit of a disadvantage because you are sort of coming to the game a lot later than the other films that you that you know we've been representing since September. Um, if that's kind of the case, we would kind of say you know to wait till you get to the short list, and then from that point let's take it on from there because then at least you have a good six seven weeks to get press around that announcement and that's that's also a huge announcement to get press around you know you've been shortlisted for the oscars um so yeah that's that's kind of my take on that that's great can, thank you can i um Go for update it, on the academy so tomorrow is the actual deadline for every festival to submit their application to be re-qualified and i'm giving you the heads up on this so that you make sure that you are looking at the most current list. I have the feeling it's going to change in the next couple of months. There'll be new festivals added. There may be festivals that are not requalified. So make sure that you're on the oscars.org website, not oscar.com, oscars.org, that's the industry website. And just make sure that uh, as you're developing that strategy, that you're using the most current list of qual of qualifying festivals. Brilliant. Thank you, Sharon. Um, we're coming close to the end, but there's a couple of questions that just going to fly them out. Um, after South by Southwest, what's the best horror film festival for a short film, in your opinion? Anyone want to throw in some horror options in there? Screen Fest, Fest, Toronto Fest. After Dark. <laughs> is, is, Fanta is Fantasia horror? Yeah. Yeah. Sip yeah. Yes, yes, that's a big one. Yeah. Okay, uh, I think this might be our last question. What stands out in a short film? Is it simplicity in a concise story or can experimental shorts be equally attractive? We have in the past worked on films. I'll give you an example from last year a very subtle, beautiful film that was Oscar and BAFTA qualified, and it was actually BAFTA nominated. Um, it was called Yellow by the director Elham Essas, and it was it was a very subtle film. It was so beautifully shot, so cine cinematic. Um, and the underlying message was freedom for women in Afghanistan. But the way that it was told, you know, you're kind of following the journey. A girl is basically going to... Uh, buy herself a full body veil and that's kind of you know it's just it was just so beautifully shot and so beautifully told and I think sometimes simplicity is the best way to go we did we we also have you know films where you have those hard hitting sort of something really really shocking happens and you're kind of sat there like oh my god like for example we worked on the Oscar nominated The After last year which was <clears throat> released on Netflix um that had that shock element in it. You know, it was a stabbing, it was all very shocking. Everything happened all of a sudden and it was just very built up. That also definitely, so it def it depends on how it's how it's filmed, how it's shot. If if you're going for sort of like that, you want that shock element, definitely go and, you know, find, do that shock element. But if you want to create something subtle, try and sort of layer it around, you know, a subject that you can sort of, some a hard hitting subject, I would say. I think it's okay. pretty sub subjective as well, though, isn't it? You know, like like how long is a piece of string? You might have one short film that is like a one take masterpiece, or you might have one that is like completely original in terms of its world building and its art direction or storytelling. But I think, for the most part, a really important thing with short filmmaking, from what I can see is that you know you have a good ending i think short films with great payoffs can really stand out and like there's a lot of short films that might be a great opening or second act but it doesn't really kind of resolve or it doesn't have to be like a feature film 
but I think I think some great short films there's 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 a strong ending I would say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We've got a flood of questions in here at the very end, but I suppose just one of them, of course, it, 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 a lot of them are around the relationship between programmers and filmmakers. And is it okay to send cold emails? Is it okay to uh, to contact them in advance of submitting the short? I would say from a personal perspective, I do like meeting filmmakers, but pick your time, do your research. I will always answer an email that has a compliment or has something that shows that you are aware of the kinds of films that I've screened or program or kind of event that I'm involved in. The cut and paste kind of email just, just drives me up a wall. Um, I do think if you can find out as much as you can about the films that were screened before, if you can attend as much as you can, um, I think most people are happy to talk about what they do, either in a forum like this or, um, you know, uh, sometimes in, in yeah, at other festivals, do you know what I mean, Bef before their own. Um, somebody has actually just asked a, a very interesting question here, and I've just got to see if I can find it now, because uh, they're flying in. Uh, this is about, about the process of applying and attending festivals. It's mostly self-funded. I, I think it pretty much is. Well, you know, culture, I know Culture, culture Ireland, Ireland. Yeah. Culture Ireland will, will support you to go to a festival. Isn't that right, TJ and Nell? with a film but you have to be accepted into that festival they're not going to to send you without that i think is that is that fair um last word i'm just trying to think if there's anything here uh best us festival for irish centric shorts romantic comedies i think to be honest good films travel the world is what i would say do you know what i mean i mean you know comedies i think there's always time for you know romantic comedies great I'd love to see more than, you know, the very sad, depressing <laughs> stories that we get often sent into. Nobody ever thinks about us programmers. Sure, they don't, Sharon, watching hours and hours of films about sadness. And then you finally see a comedy and your day just lights up like a moonbeam. I can keep going if you need to go longer. OK, well, let, let's let's take a couple more. OK, uh, we had the... the uh, the ideal length we've done. Yeah, here's an interesting one, which I think is just it's how many team how many team members are in Tribeca programming team? Do you have weekly, monthly meetings to discuss the films, or do you have one big meeting at the end? Ah, that's a good question. Well, I think we're different than a lot of other festivals. Our team is global. Um, I have people watching in Australia, in the UK, in Ireland, in uh, all throughout the United States, Canada, South America. Scandinavia. So it was important to us, to my colleague Ben and I, that we had a, a, a big voice, not just that our, that our selections were coming from decisions in the States or decisions in New York. I would say when we are at full tilt, when we hit that final deadline, this is just for shorts, there are probably 30 of us watching. And then you know, double that for features at least. So it's yeah. a pretty big team. Yeah, it's a big team. Listen, I'm conscious of everybody's time. And I just wanted to say a huge thank you. We've gone through quite a lot of questions and we've had lots and lots of different responses from everybody. Uh, thank you all so much to Shema, to Sharon, to TJ, to Nell. Uh, we've had, as I said, loads. Oh, my God, there's even more questions coming into the Q&A. This is recorded. We will be posting it. will be available for everybody. Uh, we talked about deadlines about 40 minutes ago. The regular deadline for DIFF is tomorrow. Um, and just to say, as I said, if anybody wants to sign up to DIFF Circle for the future panel discussions, please do. Um, as I said, it's all about answering some of the questions that I know are there. Thank you all so much um, for being part of this. Thank a big shout out to Screen Ireland and to the DIFF team and uh, take care everybody and hopefully as I said we'll see see each other down the road and maybe on in an actual cinema looking at a screen together all right thanks very much everybody thank you, take thank care. you Grania for moderating thank you Screen Ireland too